Great pleasure to be here again. Uh, thanks very much for HPR, Polska, and ICANN to bring me again. Uh, you really are gluttons for punishment to ask me to come again. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to be here. I was in Krakow last week at a conference, so I, I actually saw another part of Poland, which was nice. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of research on what's happening in Poland and, and countries around Poland. It's really quite interesting what's happening is that all of the concepts that we're dealing with in, uh, you know, in Central Europe or Western Europe and America, you know, they really seem to be picking up very, very quickly here. So it's really quite interesting to see this. So uh, first, um, I'm obviously, I'm on Twitter. I'm big on Twitter. Uh, who here is on Twitter? Who is Twittering or who is using Twitter? And it's okay, you can admit it. It's, there's no penalty. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, um, we'll talk about that in a second. But I'm G. Leonhard on Twitter. Uh, this presentation will be made available for downloading through Twitter this afternoon. So if you're not on Twitter yet, now you have a reason. You follow G. Leonhard to get my PDFs. And of course, also through the organization later. And I'm sure we'll also have a video. So first of all, I always do this because people are confused about what a futurist does. Uh, some people think of futurists like Ray Kurzweil or Paul Sappho or Alvin Toffler, who are you know, real futurists, <laughs> talking about 20 years from now. Most of my work is about the immediate future, which I call today. Right? I would call myself a presentist if I could, but that term is taken. So it's basically about foresights. It's not about predictions. Okay? Uh, you will not hear predictions except for the really obvious ones right? uh, that I will share with you today. But it's all about foresights. And I think foresights is part of all of our work now. Because the speed, right? the sheer speed of society, technology, changes, politics. I mean, imagine this, not a single politician, probably in the world, right, will try to run for office without the use of Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. Even in Switzerland, where I live, which is a conservative country, you know, we're not the first to do things. Right? Every politician is using social media as a way of communicating. Every company is now going online. Even Swiss Air, one of the biggest brands in Switzerland, has finally gotten around to uh, selling stuff through Facebook. So uh, these are some of my clients in the Futures Agency, my company. Our motto is, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. In other words, uh, we have to do something before the bad stuff happens. And that's what we try to do with our clients. Um, I have a hashtag. If you are on Twitter, you know what a hashtag is. You can use this on Twitter to write hashtag askgood. You can ask questions while I'm speaking. If you are distracted with your mobile phone, as most people like to do, you can ask me while I'm speaking, and I will be distracted by your tweet uh, if the internet works here. So you're welcome to use that. OK, here's some topics I want to talk about today. I used the logo from the conference because I really find it very interesting to think about smarter commerce in a larger and a global story. And here are some of my topics I want to cover today. Uh, as you can see, we'll be here in midnight uh, if I go through all of these things. But I will try to maybe jump a few times, you know, if it's timing is getting too tight. If you have any particular things you would like to talk about more than others, then please tweet or just say something. In, in real life is also OK. Yeah. So technology is leaping. Right? This is the iPhone 10. You know, it's, it's very large. Uh, let me just throw this over here somewhere. I'm getting excited about the iPhone, so I need to take my jacket off. But even more exciting, I think, is the iPhone 20, which is even larger. But <laughs> suffice to say, despite all the iPhones, you know, technology is absolutely mind-boggling. Right? Last week, I, I climbed Mount Everest. No, just joking. But you can go on Mount Everest, and you can make a YouTube video and send it from Mount Everest. You can be a company in Vietnam and make software for people in Brazil to use through the internet. You can be a designer in Greenland and work for a company in New York. You can be in a telepresence a conference call with 14 people using Cisco or HP or so telepresence and feel like you're actually in the room and you can stick a piece of paper into the screen, comes out in Hong Kong. Right? I mean, technology is mind-boggling. And it's real, a real challenge for humans, right? Because the noise is increasing. And of course, the amount of things that we could be doing is increasing. And competition is increasing. Choice. 
So technology like this, you know, it forces us, like this cartoon says, you know, uh, you look just like your Facebook profile. You know, she's a cat, of course. It's easy to look like a cat when you are a cat, right? But it's time to go beyond the obvious. So in your business today, the question is, is not only what is your customer telling you that they want, but also what are they not telling you that you think they're going to want after what they told you. I said last year on the conference that if Henry Ford, the inventor of Ford automobiles, had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Right? If you're in the telecom business today, what are people going to tell you when you ask them? They're going to say, I want it to be cheaper and faster. Oh, big surprise. But what is beyond the obvious? What do they really want? What is something that they don't know that they want? Right? That's our job to figure out if we're going to be smarter than them, so to speak, or ahead of the curve. Right? So going beyond the obvious is crucial. And I think what's happening now is because in this phase of digital technology, we're jumping from the water glass, which was the internet for the privileged, for the rich, for those that had the money, for those that were geeks. You know, we're jumping into the internet where it's basically a much larger fishbowl. Very cheap devices. In India, a tablet costs you $30. The Alakash tablet is $30 for an Android, a good tablet. Of course, not Apple, but very soon you can buy a really good smartphone for $10. Oh, you can already do that, but it's, it's a knockoff, you know, of other brands. So cheaper, and that fishbowl also means that it's a global thing now. Very soon we'll have five billion people connected to the internet. Every single business in Poland that deals with software and services will have competition from as far away as a, an island in Bali, and vice versa. Right? So think about what that means. Uh, that big fish jumping is what the founder and the lead investor, not the founder, but the lead investor in Facebook calls Solomo. Now, I hope this is not new to you, <laughs> but it's becoming a very boring phrase. In fact, everybody's talking about like data is the new oil. You know, I, I said that already like five years ago, but social local mobile is where everything is going. The future of retail, the future of money, the future of travel, the future of health, education right, is all going in this direction. So this is actually really a huge leap, and if we're looking in this direction, we can see that the internet is now being centered on those companies, except for Nokia here, as it says. Uh, the internet is now being centered on those companies that do this. The internet is contracting around those companies that are based on social, local, mobile, and all the other companies that were sort of behind the wall, like business to business, you know, chemical companies, banks, insurances, they're being dragged very quickly over the wall. So many of my clients are now big international companies like Rodia and others right, that have very little connection to the consumer space. Right? But all the people that are working there and that are working in other companies and their partners are experiencing the same thing as consumers and drag that into the company. For example, the, the idea of bring your own device. Right? Employees bring their own device to work. It's called Boyd, right? bring your own device. And this creates a huge amount of conflict. For example, many companies, Facebook is not allowed. I'm sure you have some of those companies here. Right? You can't get on Facebook on your company's internet because right? you're wasting your time. That's the theory. Guess what people do? Now they have their iPad. They just use that the whole time. They don't need your company network. Right? Completely sidestepping what's happening there. And of course, the cloud. Because IBM, the speaker before me, um, is a leader in this, right? I mean, clearly, the cloud has taken over everything. Our music, our films, our television program, our health records, our education, our books, all moving into the cloud. I mean, think about what that means when you are a technology company, but also what that means for cultural things. The music industry is essentially bankrupt as a consequence. Well, the cloud, the illegal cloud and the legal cloud, both, right? They make in 74% less than they did 10 years ago. And it's not reversible. Anybody here in the newspaper business? Anyone? Yeah? Lucky you then, because that's next. Right? Value reduction of 90%. You're going to sell an ad for 100,000 euros in the biggest uh, Polish newspaper, maybe 
maybe I think it's about 50,000 euros here, right? 150,000 for the New York Times. If you take that newspaper to the internet, how much you're going to get? 5,000, right? One tenth. So you have, to, you have to reinvent that business, and the cloud is a huge opportunity here. And of course, uh, also the good thing as Siri, you know, the iPhone tool says us, what do you look like, the cloud? In the cloud, no one cares what you look like. That's, that's a benefit, you know, I think. So, social media. Not for kids. Actually, the kids have already moved on to other cool things. Right? Maybe the new MySpace that's coming up. But the main growth in social media is business to business, actually. Business to business, social media. 87% of top 1,000 companies in the world are engaged in social media in one way or the other, and about 15% of the CEOs are blogging and writing about what they do. So I would call this the social OS, the social operating system, not social media. I think we should, in fact, forget about the word social media because it leads us to believe there's some sort of magic secret. You know, we can make a Facebook page and sell quicker, you know, or you know, build a better mousetrap, like, uh, like we talked about in November, right? This is uh, Facebook users in Poland, this graph. 25% roughly of Polish people are on Facebook. And 42%, or what is it, what's the number there? 42% roughly of all of the internet users. So you can say what you want about Facebook's stock performance, right? But Facebook is a highway. Ignoring Facebook would be just like ignoring, ignoring Google. I mean, there's a business model that's waiting to be formed on Facebook of selling direct. Airlines are already on Facebook selling tickets directly on Facebook. So clearly a shift towards the social ads here are the leading Facebook pages in Poland, and congratulations to Play, which was one of my clients, not that it has anything to do with that, but Play and Orange and, you know, Plus and Allegro are the top companies, and the first one I don't even know, you probably do, but they have the most popular Facebook page. I mean, it's interesting to see what's happening here. This is my good friend Charlie Rose, who's a brilliant uh, moderator and uh, um, a, a, great, a great guy, not a personal friend, just a spiritual good friend, right? He's interviewing Mark Anderson, who I'm sure you know, Anderson, the founder of Netscape, lead investor in Facebook and board member of Facebook, and see what he says about the social, local, mobile evolution. Yeah, I think if we're, we're, on, the, we're on the tipping point with the convergence of smartphones, the convergence of uh, social networks, the convergence of online video, like these are the things, these things are happening right now. Marketers, most companies, most agencies are not yet uh, are not yet taken advantage of, are not yet all over the kinds of opportunities that certainly exist. In the next three years, I mean, it's sort of a cliche, but it's actually true. The next three years are going to see more transformation and change than we've probably seen in the last 10 or 15 years. The next three years will see more transformation than we've seen in the last 10 years, and I think that's nowhere more true than in Poland and companies like and countries like Poland. Right? Because there's so many things happening at the same time. Next three years will be absolutely mind-boggling. So, what we have here is a revolution in technology, innovation, and habit changes. Right? Now, when you go to the bar in the evening, guys used to talk about cars or women, or women talked about guys, maybe, I suppose. I don't know. But you know what they, what they do now? Is they're checking out which app do you have. Right? You're talking to each other about what apps you have on your smartphones. I mean, this is a complete habit change, and also a commerce revolution. A, a Polish guy, I think, uh, founded this company, Odesk. Uh, I think they're now based in California, but this was a Polish company. Odesk. Okay? Odesk is a way of finding engineers that has taken the world by storm. It's like an eBay for engineers and technical talent. Millions of people are hired through Odesk remotely to do jobs for companies. This has absolutely exploded. Airbnb. Anybody know Airbnb? If you're traveling anywhere, this is the alternative to hotels now. It's people renting out their castles, houses, apartments, and small hotels directly to the web. And this place has exploded that in Paris, every single street in Paris, in the central uh, places in Paris, has an apartment available on Airbnb, every single street. So that business model is only possible because of social, of course, you have a rating there. 
is a question of trust, right? We have a commerce revolution there. So the question I have for you uh, is, are you and is your company ready for a really a network business, you know, what Ericsson calls a network society? Cars will be connected to the internet. My scale, right? I, if I want to lose weight, I can compete with others and publish my weight. I mean, I, I'm not doing that, but I do want to lose weight, but I don't connect the scale. And of course, people, right? I mean, mind-boggling what we're seeing with the network society. And really, the trend is that it used to be one too many, like MTV. Now it's also many too many. MTV is still pretty big, I think, in Poland. But in many countries, MTV has lost out completely to YouTube. I mean, just ask your kids. And why is that? Because YouTube, they make the program. Right? It's many to many. There is no guy in New York who runs the program for YouTube, like it is on MTV, right? or a bunch of guys. Right? One too many, many too many. So Airbnb compared to Hilton, right? they have zero cost. They're renting out other people's places. And of course, you know, it's not a question of either or. Hilton will not go bankrupt because of Airbnb. Right? It's a parallel process. But basically, we're seeing our entire society moving into this direction of becoming networked. And this does not mean network in the sense of equal. That part of that meaning is that, right? But to be connected and interconnected with other companies. Look at all the successful business models in the last decade. In some way or the other, they're all borrowing from this idea of a network society. Not just tech companies, right? car rental companies, airlines. So in this system, we really have this trend towards network brands, connected brands. Connected to their users, connected to partners, and connected to competitors, which is, of course, the hard part. Here's a great video from a, a Polish newspaper. I think it's called the Gazeta Wyborcza. Sorry if I don't know about this. But they actually are showing what's happening in that shift in this really interesting sort of cartoon commercial. So what's the message here? It said, we don't care how you read our newspaper, whether it's on the computer or on devices, because what we do goes beyond how you get it. And the value is in the fact that you have curation, you have different embodiments, you have different ways of looking at this. I mean, it's a great example of how to become a network organization. But let's be aware that network business is not business as usual. I mean, the disruption here is quite Strong and, and the longer we wait, I think the stronger the disruption is. Disruption is. I mean, look at what's happening to newspapers. Uh, this is U.S. Right? Newspaper advertising revenues. If you're in that business, you're worried. And, and this will happen here in Poland as well. Right now, it's still not like this. But the question is not if, but when. And look at these numbers. Global study: digital news surpasses newspaper and radio. More people are consuming news on digital devices than there are on radio or printed news. Right? Look at the graph, that's the red line at the bottom. Today, 60% of CEOs are using social media to talk about what they do. In the future, it'll be 57% in a few years. It's a projection. CEOs talk not about their company secrets, but about the business. The new iPhone allows you to use a thing called Passbook, which is the bridge between the digital world and the real world. So you can get a coupon from Starbucks you can log into when you go into a store to receive communication directly from the store using different kinds of technologies, including, of course, uh, Wi-Fi and GPS, but also others, I think, also using magnetic fields and so on. Look at the explosion in telecom services, how people will be connecting. Target using coupons already is widespread as part of the iPhone in the US. Doctors going online, sharing their information, sharing the, the patients' data with other doctors and even remotely operating through a, through a data channel. I mean, the idea of network business, Walmart, for example, has embraced the idea of, of scanning bars in the store and com comparing with other stores and products while you're shopping. Complete overlap of physical and digital. We'll talk about that later. 
And of course, here's the play page on, on Facebook. But uh, network business is not business as usual. What is the difference? Well, the difference is you're connected with others. Right? So it's more of a conversation right, rather than a monologue. It's more of an interaction before the transaction, which I also talked about last year. And this is kind of painful because many of us are saying, you know what, I don't want to talk to all those people about what they think about my company or me. They should just buy my ticket or just buy the software or whatever. Right? But now it's all part of this interactive environment to where people are expecting you to have conversation. Now here's the chief of Tesco. I found this two nights ago when I was looking for examples. Tesco, of course, one of the biggest grocery chains in the world, starting in the UK. Uh, having complete mobile access to all of the ordering and tracking where the food is and stuff. And the CEO of Tesco, Philip Clark, he says, the choice we face is a stark one, a tough one. Do we lead the revolution or do we become victims of the evolution? And this is a guy who runs, I don't know how many employees they have, like 100,000 employees or something. Right? It's huge. Right? He's basically saying that apps, applications on phones, are the new high street. I wouldn't quite go that far. Right? But clearly he's showing that you know, pe what people do in shopping is now dramatically changing. Right? I mean, all the stuff he says in this article, which was on Retail Week last week, right? he says, in the new world, retail will not be about buying large swathes of new real estate, but about how we relate to our customers. That answers the question that Magdalena was mentioning when she introduced me <laughs> about what is first, right? Clearly, it's first the interaction and then the transaction. We want to skip that, you know? It's quicker if we skip, get right to it, right? But that's unlikely. And I think this guy is realizing what's happening here. And the final word he says, right? He says, I don't want us to be part of the future. I want us to help to shape the future. And Tesco, I think, also has operations in, in Poland as well. But clearly is expanding with this idea across the world. So let's capture this for a second. This is a lot of... Uh, Input is, of course, easy for them to say they're a huge company with lots of revenues, but lead the revolution or be the victim of evolution. It happens to me every single day, you know, through my clients and directly through us. I mean, if you want to listen to a smart guy talk, you can just go to TED.com, right? There's what, I don't know, 50,000 videos <laughs> of smart talks, right? Do you need me for that? So every day there's a challenge of evolution, you know, something that we have to talk about. And this is, I think, in many ways, what we're going to see in the next three years, money being sucked out of the system because we're not a connected company. We're, not, we're sort of disconnected from what people are doing. So kind of shocking to me that many of you are not on Twitter. I'm not going to ask who's on Facebook because most people don't lift their hand for this. But in many countries, asking whether somebody's on Facebook is like asking if you're going to go to the bathroom later. Right? Well, of course, it's like saying I don't use Google, you know, whatever the reason would be. Right? But if you're trying to do business with the clients of tomorrow, which are social, local, and mobile and connected, but you're not doing it yourself, right? how can you possibly expect to know what they may want? That would be like saying that the Pope is going to make a law about things that he's never looked at or done, right? which, we ha of course, we have that challenge. Right? is a disparity of position. So that's something that we have to look at. I do we actually do this ourselves? Right? And this is, of course, great news in Poland that we do have huge growth in the IT sector. I mean, this article shows growth from 24% in 2012. And this graph here, a little bit hard to see, right, shows that Poland is actually doing very well in this regard. So I would encourage you to go a little bit further and actually do what the customers are doing. Ericsson has some pretty mind-boggling research saying that 85% of the world's population will be covered by high-speed mobile broadband in 2017. Here in Poland, of course, in many cases, it's at least something to be desired, right? It's, it's coming, but it's, it's definitely not all here yet. The mobile internet services broadband is, still needs to grow a lot, but has grown already a lot. But the numbers here are pretty mind-boggling. 85% of the population will have 3G, 50% of the world's population have 4G, and smartphone subscriptions to be over three billion. Now Cisco is projecting that 80% of the entire internet traffic will be on mobile devices in five years. 80%. Complete switch from the desktop to the mobile environment. So if your company doesn't have a mobile website, 
if you're not mobile optimized and all that stuff, I mean, we discussed last year, right? That should be tomorrow's work. Clearly, that's where all of the things are happening. So we have this challenge where we have the old order, you know, the way that things used to be. And then we have the new order, which is starting in parallel. We sort of have to try to do both, right? And this is quite hard. We have to continue to do the old business. For example, if you're a book publisher, you're still going to sell books in print. But Amazon already sells more books on the Kindle electronically than they sell in print, right? So what are you going to do? You're going to stop printing? Right? Can't really stop printing, so you have to do both at the same time, right? This real challenge, uh, and it's, and it's in a way sort of schizophrenic, right? You have to be somewhat dualistic to do both. Right? This is quite a challenge, I think, especially for larger companies. But I work a lot with people in the print space, and this is clearly the innovation space. If you're, if you're dealing with this kind of challenges, the, the overlap between paper and print and digital. And I think that goes for a lot of companies, that the innovation is actually somewhere in the middle. For example, now you can go to a bookstore, and you can use Apple Passbook, and very soon also, of course, from Android and other OSs, including Nokia, I think, a, a way of looking at the books and pulling up information about the book while you're looking at it. And also, of course, compare prices, which you can already do with Shopkick. But you can be sent a coupon while you're there from the publisher that knows that you're looking for that book. So you have a choice to buy digital or in print or both. So you can be in the store, look at the book, get a coupon that gives you 30% off the book, and at the same time, get a download of the Kindle book for free. Right? Because it's completely meshed between digital and physical. Now, that is promising to me. And the reason it's promising not is because it makes life easier for us. It does not. Right? We have to, there's a lot of organization involved. Right? Because it's totally addictive to the, to the customer. As uh, Jeffrey, I think, right, from IBM was saying earlier, it's all about that. Right? You go and delight the customer, then you win. Right? And this is what these systems will do, this conversion. I work a lot in Brazil. And there's a leading newspaper called Folha. And Folha has uh, an interesting ad campaign. They run this ad everywhere, and they're saying, you know what? We don't care how you consume our newspaper. It could be print, it could be the iPad, the iPhone, even the Blackberry, or even a Nokia phone. Right? Doesn't matter. I mean, a, a dumb phone, not a Nokia phone, but just a low-tech low phone. Right? Print is just another screen. Well, I'll say that to a publisher now, they're going to faint. Because right? print for them is, th the money is in print. right? The money is not in digital. The money is moving to digital, but it's not quite here. So there's a challenge of overlap, but that's where we're going. Right? So the, the, the key word here is, this is taken from the IBM Curiosity Shop on Flickr, which I found Google, Googling around, is that the key word is to be interconnected. Interconnected with others. I mean, as this plumbing of the city shows, you know, city doesn't operate with one company running all the pipes. Right? It interacts with lots and lots of moving parts. And unfortunately, I think that in the past, we've had lots of industries that were ecosystems. You know, Microsoft. Not to say that that's a bad thing, it's just that basically they dominated it. Today we have system, uh, businesses that are ecosystems, that are interconnected. So there's a lot more collaboration going on, which I'll talk about in a second. Take banks, for example. Ever since the financial crisis, you don't want to say that you work at a bank or that you're an investment advisor. Right? I'm sure there's some banks in this room. Right? What's happening right now is that every single bank wants to be social, connected with their customers in these social networks, right? And, and through LinkedIn and others, they want to create an appearance of conversation. And the same goes for banks that are looking, for example, to add value, like a property guide. So this bank, for example, is, is offering an app that has nothing to do with banking. It's a free property guide. Right? Hospitals are connecting, and in the US, PricewaterhouseCoopers has said that over What's the number? 57% of people ask, they choose a hospital based on what they do in social media. What other people are saying about the hospital. Now, this is, of course, Americans. You know, Americans are very quick with this. It's not quite the same in Europe yet. <laughs> Hospitals don't tweet in Europe or don't have Facebook pages uh, to a large degree. That's just now coming. Uh, banking with friends, like in Germany, the Fedor Bank, borrowing from, from strangers on the internet and Shell using a system called Yammer, which is like an internal Twitter, right, to talk to each other about stuff that happens on a daily basis. 90% of all B2B marketers, this is uh, US, UK, 
are engaged in some form of social media outreach. Social media is simply CRM, and CRM is social media. It's as simple as that. It becomes part of a conversation that you're having with your client, your providers, your vendors, and so on. And right now, LinkedIn seems like the preferred platform for all these conversations to happen. But I think that will probably go a little bit broader in the future. Let's talk about money for a second, a minor topic. Right? But it's quite clear that we probably won't be having cash in 10 years in many countries. Right? It's also quite clear that we probably won't be having credit cards. I mean, think about that for a second. Right? The code of your account and the permission is embedded in that card that you carry around with you. There's absolutely no reason why that couldn't be anywhere else, like on your mobile phone, right? except for, of course, privacy and other reasons <laughs> and habits. Right? But clearly what's happening here, right? the future of money, this is a great report, right? and the bottom line is, this is UK, 65% agreed that by 2020 most people will have embraced and fully adopted the use of a smart device swiping for purchases they make. Well, that's already true in Finland. I can buy a Coke can, I can buy my ticket. You know. That's already true in many countries. But that's a huge opportunity right here. And I think that, of course, the telcos are looking at this and saying, you know, we should be looking at stuff like this app, I think it's called Square, where you can pay with your credit card using an iPhone plug-in, like a piece of plastic that swipes it. The mobile money revolution is absolutely huge. In Africa, for example, it's most of the transactions are done through the mobile. And uh, as this article says, that you can't wait on the mobile payment strategy. So whatever you're doing, if you're selling stuff, payment has to be done sooner or later through mobile devices, not just credit cards or PayPal. Right? And whoever the telecom provider is that does this, or, or PayPal or whatever, right? this is, of course, a crucial thing that we need for that to really work and for people to trust it. So uh, this is an uh, Africa uh, service called M-Pesa in Nigeria and Tanzania, I think, as well. Most of the payments that people make to each other for work of small transactions are handled direct on the dumb phone through SMS. It's a huge cultural shift. Just give it five years. I think in most countries will be using a mobile phone in this way. Biggest obstacle, of course, is that I don't want to necessarily always be tracked with what I'm paying, right? what I'm paying for. So that, that is something that we have to solve this problem. Right? But clearly, you know, the, the outlook there goes in the direction that internet companies will mostly do that for us. Internet companies, technology companies, and credit card companies. But mostly internet companies. So if you're a bank or financial institution, if 34% of financial transactions will be handled by internet companies, right, using the web as a backbone, right, over the top, where does your money go? from the credit cards transaction and from the banking. I mean, that's, that's a huge challenge right there. And that's somewhat easy money at this time. Location. Again, if you haven't tried this, you need to download Foursquare or use Facebook and then go to a big city. I think it actually works in Warsaw. And log into, when you're in the mall, log into Facebook or, or Foursquare and tell them where you are and you will get offers from participating retailers. I already purchased like 10 Gap jeans for free. You know, Gap is a jeans brand in America, right? So the way you do this is you, you like Gap on Facebook, right? you go to the store, you, you tell Facebook that you're in the mall, and then the Gap realizes that you're there, and they can send you a promotion to pick up a pair of jeans for $5 or for free. I mean, it, jeans only cost them 60 cents or whatever, so it's not a big loss for them. But what happens here is that they breed lots of loyalty. Right? They make me think they're my friend. Right? And next time I want to buy a jeans, I, I don't get a coupon. I still go to the Gap. Right? That's how it works. Location-based services are a gold mine for retailing, of course, for, you know, for all kinds of services. If you're looking at what's happening uh, with store detail, uh, stuff or TripAdvisor, all these kind of things. Asia, of course, is the leader in this. Uh, finding like-minded people. I mean, this works for dating. This works for people who are in a conference. Now there's apps when you're in a football game, you can find your friends in the crowd. So you can meet up later, right? those kind of applications. Coupons, we talked about that earlier. 
location stuff like this. And the best is Siri. Have you tried Siri on the iPhone or speaking to your phone? I'm sure you have tried it. Ask Siri, I'm going to jump off a bridge and die. It will actually tell you where the nearest bridge is, <laughs> which is extremely useful. Yeah. I mean, you know, I didn't jump off, as you can see. The bridge was 26 miles away. So anyway, uh, mobile first. Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, said this years ago, and we didn't really believe it because, you know, it was clumsy. Right? But now it's really all about mobile. Right? And here in Poland, yes, here in Poland is going to happen even quicker once we have the infrastructure in place, which I think many telcos are currently working on. And the biggest drivers of growth in content is mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, and of course, you know, improving broadband is right number two. <laughs> so if you're in a telco business here, some of you, clearly that is a requirement for that to happen, that it actually works. Google has a great series of slideshows on multi-screen and multi mobile first. I think the, uh, the one is called the new multi-screen world. You can download it from just Google for it. It's like 80 slides that you have to read. It's free, of course. They're talking about this, you know, basically the ma majority of our interactions are screen-based. Now, this is becoming a reality. Smartphones are where people are starting for their com commerce activities. And in some cases you could say, well, it's not quite that case here yet, but I think it's coming very quickly. This is, of course, U.S. Uh, now I think it's actually global numbers. Right? But there's a, um, an interesting trend happening is that we are starting to use whatever the nearest or the best screen is. So when we're in the taxi, we use the iPhone. At home, we use the iPhone to command the television or any other smartphone for that matter, right? We read the news on paper, but then if we're on the airplane, we read it on a, on a tablet where we have saved it, right? We switch back and forth. Whatever screen is available, and this is, I think, becoming a very big trend because it influences how we buy. Right? If you're not ready for multi-screen buying, you're, making, you're having a huge problem, right? Multi-screen means whatever the user is using at that moment, whether it's a wristwatch that's connected to the internet or a smartphone or the television. There's a technology called Shazam that you may have heard about. Uh, Shazam basically does audio fingerprinting. And what they do in America, and this is, I think, it's already a global thing as well, you can use Shazam to listen to the TV show that you're watching. And Shazam will identify the TV show based on the audio fingerprint. And it will show you on your tablet or your smartphone the actors, the rating, what people are saying about the show, the products used in the TV show, synchronized live stream as you're watching, what other people are saying and what your friends are thinking about the show, if you want that too. It's called the second screen. Imagine what this does for buying. There's an eBay app that you can download. I think currently it only works in America eBay will monitor what you're watching on TV and it will show you the products in the TV show to buy on eBay in real time while you're watching. This is one of the biggest innovations. I mean, I, would, I could care less because, you know, if I want to see TV, I don't want to buy anything. But, but a lot of people do care about that. So what is the estimated time of arrival of the ETA in Poland for this? I don't know. You have to tell me. I could not find out last night just Googling, you know. Google doesn't have the answer for everything. But I think it's sooner than we think, much sooner than we think. We have explosions in, in disruptive technologies like augmented reality, Google Glass, all sounds science, like science fiction, but it's around the corner. And having the mobile phone be like our external brain. Right? I mean, think about this for a second. You're having an argument with your wife about what the capital of XYZ is, of the Kazakhstan, right? Where are you going to go to find the answer while you're talking, and then she pulls up Wikipedia and the question is answered, right? That has become our external brain. Right? Mobile phones have become our external brain, our external shopping bag, our external friends directory. That's actually kind of scary when you think about it, right? And that's going to get much, much more elaborate, right? Here's an uh, example from Samsung. Okay, 
face recognition and motion control works using an integrated camera on the top of each TV. It also added new hardware to Now here's something to worry about. Right? <laughs> integrated camera on the TV. <laughs> right? So this television, this is not just Samsung, right? This television, A, you can speak to, which is going to be a standard in the next few years. You can control with gestures, so you can sit like this and you can pull data out like a minority report, like this. It can translate languages, but the worst part, of course, or the best part, depends who you're talking to, is that it can see your face and see if you're happy or not, right? and it'll change the ads as a consequence. Right? Actually, Intel and Samsung are coming up with a plan where they recognize your face, not the person, that's not legal. Right? but whether you're male or female and how old you are, and changes the ad in the TV show to be synchronized with who you are. Right? But that's a little bit science fiction. Let's stick with the first two, gestures and speaking to devices. I mean, the stuff that Siri does today on the iPhone and Google and so on, that, that's kind of basic, right? But the future clearly will have that interface change of talking to devices, you know, asking your device what the best deal is for an airline ticket. That is clearly not very, not very far away. I tried this out in the Google Labs myself. Language recognition and translation. You can speak in German, it comes out in Chinese on the other side, in real time. That's about three years away for commercial applications. Imagine what that will do to customer support. Right? You can actually speak in Polish to anyone in the world. It will come out maybe not in Finnish, which would be hard, right? but many, many other languages. Computing, right? Moving to a place to where you can have, uh, this is a device called the Leap, where you can control the computer with the hands in front of the computer. This works for anything, a tablet or a, a laptop and even a mobile device where you can, you can draw, you can do all that stuff that we know from science fiction movies. That will change commerce, of course, forever if we're looking at what's actually happening there. The cultural shifts, of course, they're not all positive, and I'll, I'll make you think a little bit with this short clip here. Patrick? Oh. Hi. Hi, Daphne, how are you? Sorry. Okay. You look great. Thank you. Love your jacket. Thanks. Uh, it's actually, it's a, it's a sports jacket, so it's a lot less official than it looks. What do you mean? What's the difference between a sports jacket and a normal one? Uh, I guess a sports jacket is for people who want to look good even when they're chased by the police. Anyway, I hope you're hungry. Yeah. Yeah. I have had some fast burgers in town. Oh, actually, I'm vegetarian. Oh, yeah. Really? But you didn't say it in your profile. Okay, so this guy has a, 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 contact, a contact lens right, that is receiving internet data. This is not far-fetched. It actually works quite nicely already. This is the next step from Google Glass, right? So there, there will be lots of social things that we will find very, very strange in the next few years. I mean, already, of course, having a smartphone and constantly looking at it is already antisocial, really. Right? So you can talk to people better through the mobile phone than when they're sitting right next to you in many cases. So there'll be quite a few challenges in this direction, I think, that we have to master in the next few years. But let's look at some of the examples of what hap what's happened in, in smart business. The Huffington Post, which has taken over AOL, one of the biggest internet companies in the world, right? Ariane Huffington has taken over AOL as a result of inventing this thing called social news. Social news means I log in and I see the news from my friends who are qualified to tell me what's happening in a filtered system. And also, of course, using my friends to write for the same publication. They have about 5,000 writers. Right? They have reinvented the concept of news. And I think in a way that's not so easy to actually copy. Right? But this is, to me, uh, definitely an application of smarter commerce. There's a great report out by The Economist in RICO called uh, Disruption in the, in the Future of Business. It's also available on the web for free. You should download it. But they basically list all that stuff that seems a little bit off for us, but that's here today, holographics, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, computers that compare data for us, all these kind of things. But going back to what I said in the beginning, 
this is our choice, and I said this already last year, it's good to repeat. Right? We can either be disrupted by those things, or we can disrupt using those things. We don't have a choice of saying we're not participating. Worst example, of course, my favorite example is the music business, that in uh, 1999 experienced Napster, you know, free trading of music, and they realized that people really do want the music to live in the cloud and then get to it quickly and maybe download and not buy physical products. That was 14 years ago, 13 years ago. But they said, we don't want to be disrupted in this way, so we'll cover it legally, right? we'll destroy it. Result being that the industry has shrunk 72%. Today we have Napster and it's called Spotify, right? or Simfy, it's the same idea basically. Right? We have it anyway. So the question is, when you see all these trends in your business, people going on social networks, people going on LinkedIn, checking you out before the meeting, competitors using mobile apps and stuff, the question is not whether that is the future, because clearly it is, whether you're going to allow that kind of disruption or be part of it. Because today, as, a, as this picture with Robert Downey shows, is that information today flows, it doesn't download. In other words, things are moving so quickly that the, the way that we learn and change things today is by basically tipping our hand into the flow of what's happening and then react, rather than digesting it all. And this is one of the fundamentally flawed principles of uh, you know, MBA business studying is the idea of ROI calculation, right? Calculating, you know, what happens when I download all these things, I make a plan, I react, and then I carry out the plan. By the time, time you've done this, there's been 5,000 rivers of flow of data and competitors already by your screen. Right? So how do you do that? I mean, how do you actually change in real time? Fundamental uh, change, there's lots of great stuff on the HBR blog about this from Omer Haig and many others, about how to do real-time business innovation. I think fundamentally, a lot of the things that we used to do are totally flawed here. Because they require this download process, you know, the download and digestion and the planning process that in many cases is too, too wide and too far. You've seen this in every single country around the world, the total conversions of internet and television. In fact, television is now becoming part of the internet. And by, this is the saving grace of television, right? unlike the music business. Right? It works together very nicely. In less than five years, the Polish television and all the major stations in, in, in Poland will be an app on your screen, with just one of the apps. An important app, right? a state-funded app, a paid for taxes. I'm not sure if you pay TV taxes in Poland. I think you do, right? We do in Switzerland, it's like 200 euros a year. But what happens here is when television becomes just an app, then the state television in Poland or RTL or BBC is one of my 40 or 50 choices of TV channels on my, on my tablet. I have TED.com, I have, I have Big Think, I have Fora, I have whatever, right? These are apps that I use to watch TV. Think about what that means for marketing also. Where are you going to put your marketing money? Chances are very little you're going to put all your marketing money into television or radio in five years. Because the audience goes like this, right? it, it fragments. So lots of thinking about what the future of marketing is. You know, we're clearly going from a scenario of uh, broadcasting to what I call broadbanding. I mean, just ask a 16-year-old what broadbanding is. Of course, they don't know the term, right? But for them, it's the mobile social lifestyle. That's connected to the internet at all times. Right? I mean, it's like having water, right? electricity. I mean, it's not all good. I'm not saying it's, you know, it's obviously there's lots of distraction involved with that as well, right? But we have this interchange between the television and the consumers themselves who also publish things. For example, Ford, uh, Ford cars had one of the most amazing promotions about two and a half years ago in the US uh, where Ford said, we have, we're bringing out the Ford Fiesta again in, in America. They didn't really know how to, how to market it. And what they said is that if you're a video maker, if you promise to make one video a month where you're driving the Ford and you're doing something, it could be good or bad, doesn't matter. Right? You make one video a month with the car, we'll give you a Ford Fiesta for free. I think they gave away 400 or so Ford Fiestas to 400 people. 
and they made videos and put it on the, uh, what is called the, the Fiesta Experience. And guess how many of those videos were bad? And the car is truly bad, by the way. Guess how many of those videos were really like bad about the car? Two. For more than 10,000 videos. Not just because it was free, because it was a fun thing to do. And, and you know, when you're driving, you don't necessarily want to be negative. Right? So this, art in, this involving of people has become a major trend in marketing. And now that every screen is becoming a connected television, a radio, or a reader. Right? Basically, every screen. Think about that. If you make a mistake as a bank, as an insurance company, as a politician, as, a, as government, as a futurist, whatever, you make a mistake, the next connected screen talks about it. Right? This is why you can't afford to lie any longer. This is a very, very big problem, is that in, in commerce and business, there's many things that we, we would prefer for our customers not to know. You know, they, they, maybe something didn't quite work right. Or maybe this customer is getting a different kind of loan than that customer for no reason whatsoever. Right? I mean, imagine yourself living in a world of perpetual WikiLeaks. A world that's more or less transparent. I believe that some things, of course, have to be secret, clearly. You know, military, banking, and so on and so on. Company secrets. But in general, you know, the, the trend toward being transparent is huge. People want to know what you look like. They want to know your rating. Does any of you still book a hotel outside of Poland, maybe, with not going and checking out what people say about the hotel? I'd be surprised. Right? And you travel somewhere. I mean, my, my mother, who is 77 years old, right? she doesn't use the internet, of course, not yet. She calls me up and says, I'm going to take this trip with this old people's club, you know somewhere in Austria. Could you Google the hotel right, to see how good it is? Because she knows what it does. Right? So this is the effect of transparency. That goes for banks, for politicians, for insurance companies, for artists, for writers. Right? This is a rapid trend towards being transparent. So we're moving from a paper culture to a screen culture. And in many ways, that's too bad. You know, I love paper. I write books. I would much prefer people to buy my, my real book and give me real money for my real book, or, or rather the publisher the money, so to speak. Right? But it's all about screens now. We have to figure out how we're going to get onto people's screens, and that the way to do that is not to say that there's no other way but us to get on the screen. The way is to have an offering where people are saying, this is so great, I've got to have this. I mean, to attract the customer to get our app. So if you're an insurance company, how do you do this? Well, you add value. You give people something that goes beyond calculating how, how their rate is. Right? You give them a service. And there's many, many examples. I'll show you some of those in the future. But we're clearly going to a world of um, access, not ownership. A world of where we're clearly seeing that most of what we do has to do with being able to find stuff. Access, not ownership. So going back to what I said in the beginning, right? we're jumping in this new fishbowl. And I would definitely encourage you not to have the illusion that you can stay in the water glass. Right? There isn't going to be any water glass in a couple of years. Right? Everybody is moving in this direction. And I think really what that means is, I think, for the future of business, the connected business, CRM, marketing, advertising, R&D, communications, distribution, all moving in this direction. Most large companies like Procter & Gamble and Unilever finding already up to 20% of the new product ideas from their customers. Asking their customers to invent the next product. Right? To tell them what the soap should look like. To build their new car. Right? It's called crowdsourcing. And we discussed last year quickly. There's a great book that just came out, uh, well, actually about three years ago, from Jeff Ho called Crowdsourcing. You should definitely take a look at that. And I think to me that sort of symbolizes smarter commerce for me going forward. There's one crucial requirement I think that we keep coming up against, especially uh, when we're talking about making money and monetizing stuff, that we used to all be in these silos. You know, we have product people and marketing people, and they, don't, they hate each other usually. Uh, sales and biz dev and the branding guys, you know, this is all in separate universes. Well, guess what? The future is basically game over for this. If your companies run like this, 
and look for another job. Because what happens here is that as things move quicker and quicker, we don't have time to check with the sensibilities of the other guys. We're building this together, right? It's actually the product is the marketing. In many cases, you know, the iPad, of course, being the perfect example, right? It, it sells itself, so to speak. I mean, the cult of Apple is a perfect example, right? So that idea of being in silos is game over. So now we're coming to a world like this, and this is, uh, let me tell you, this is a painful place until you get used to this. Because just until a few years ago, we were the wheel in the middle, but there weren't any other wheels. This was our brain, our company, our intellectual property, our distribution. You know, you, you can own the ecosystem. Ownership of ecosystems, Swisscom, right, until just a few years ago, the only provider in Switzerland. If you want to make a mobile phone call, you have, you have to go with them, right? They have a monopoly. They're, the only one system. Microsoft, not in a bad way, but clearly that was a sort of a hegemony for a long time. Uh, many companies that were built on this kind of idea, and now we have this idea that technology is forcing us to invent an ecosystem, right, to actually figure out how we can connect with the other wheels. So I think the future is about hyper-collaboration. One mission for you tonight when you come home after this event, right, when you lie in bed with your iPhone next to you, or your Samsung phone, whatever you're using, BlackBerry for a bit. Uh, think about who can you collaborate with that you've always thought was your prime competition. The people who are looking to kill your company, to take you over from underneath. Using this approach, saying, okay, how can we join together with those pieces? Great example is... Um, Patagonia, the company that makes clothes. Right? Patagonia has known for a long time that many of their customers are collecting Patagonia jackets but not actually wearing them very much and essentially wasting resources. And environmental companies have been shooting at Patagonia for a long time about how they say that they are green but they're not really green. Right? So Patagonia said, what we're going to do is we're going to run an ad huge ad campaign all over the world that says, don't buy this jacket. At the name, there was, the top line was a jacket, on top of it was, don't buy this jacket. To tell people that they don't need a new jacket if they already have four, or at the very least they can buy a used one from eBay, which they used to not want to sell through. So they were essentially jumping into the pool of competing with their, with their toughest competitors, which were the ones, people saying that this is all wasteful economy, and they sold 12% more jackets that year. Which, of course, grant you, that wouldn't work for everyone. <laughs> it's just an example. Right? So, hyper-collaboration. And I think, to me, that requires leadership. And uh, my good friend Albert Einstein, that I, that I visited in the Vax Museum, uh, he said creativity is the residue of time wasted. This is a very un-German thing to say, of course. But if we don't waste time to experiment with what our clients, our customers, and the population at large is doing, we're not going to innovate. I mean, how are we possibly going to move forward if we don't do what everybody else is doing? Facebook used to be considered a time waste. Remember that? Just about 12 years ago, Google was considered a time waster. Yeah, you can search for things, big deal. YouTube was considered a time waster. Twitter is considered the ultimate time waster, and it can be. But guess what? If you don't have time wasted, you're not going to create the thing of tomorrow. The mission in every country and every company has to be, and that's what I usually propose, 3 to 5% of every employee's time has to be allocated towards inventing and creating something new that can help the company to be different. At Google, the rule is 10% for non-engineers and 20% for engineers. Every engineer at Google has to spend 20% of their time on new projects, to which they can get instant funding from the department, up to, I think, $20,000 or $50,000 in the second level. And if you don't come forward with ideas, you get fired. If you don't waste time, you get fired. Think about that. Efficiency and productivity isn't the same as inventing the future. 
I'm happy to discuss with you later if you, if you think different. But you know, Einstein said that, so he must be right. Another thing, this is a Kiwi map, a New Zealand map of the world. And you can see, of course, it's the wrong way around. It's the right way around for the Kiwis, for the New Zealand people. Seeing things in new ways becomes a crucial skill. Which people at your company can see things differently? You should promote them to be the chief see things different officer. I mean, that's the kind of people you need to invent what your company is going to be tomorrow. You know what the car companies, all of the major car brands, BMW, Audi, Mercedes, and so on, are working on right now at high speed? Guess what? Guess what? Any guess? Well, everybody says electric cars, right? True. But you know what they're really working on? Self-driving cars. Cars that drive themselves. And you know what they're working on after that? Transportation in a larger sense. Tubes that shoot people under the ground. I'm not kidding. I mean, why in the world would a car company work on a self-driving car when it's clearly not a status symbol to have a car that drives itself? That's a utility. So car companies are using this approach and saying, today we're about cars, tomorrow we're about transportation. So whatever business you're in, you know, if you're in a bank, today you're about money, financial services, what are you about tomorrow? What is the step beyond the obvious? Great example of smarter commerce is also this company called Sonos. Uh, if you're a hi-fi enthusiast and you're streaming music from the internet through Spotify or other services, whatever, iTunes also, of course, Sonos is the uh, speaker system where you can put speakers all over the house and have different music and different volumes all over the house in different places, wirelessly. It's a great system. I've been using it for a long time. Now, Sonos had this box on the left up there. This box cost $300, and it was the Sonos controller. You had to use this box to tell which room had what music. Okay. Now, when the mobile phone and apps came along three years ago or so, and, and it became uh, popular to control stuff with a mobile phone, Sonos said, well, now we have a problem, because people who are using this box for $300, they're controlling their music. They're telling us that why in the world do we need this box? This could be an app. Right? I mean, it could be controlled with software with a with mobile phone, right? An app. And then someone said, this is not a good idea. You know, we have about 600,000 people giving us $300 for this box. And then the user said, you know what? We don't care about your calculations. Make it an app. Right? And then someone said, well, how am I going to charge $200 for an app? Good luck with that, right? So what did they do? Made the app free and ate a loss of $20 million. If they hadn't done this, I swear they'd be dead today. Instead, they're the market leader in streaming music around the world in high-end hi-fi systems for streaming music. Because be bold, but don't be stupid. I think I ended with this last year at the conference. I think this is very, very important. That this is forcing us to make bold moves, to make the right decision. Newspapers. In Poland, it's not looking quite so grim, but clearly the world is transitioning to digital news. So what are newspapers doing? They're saying, well, you know, people are not so happy to pay for news, and the, the likelihood of people actually paying for digital news is very, very difficult. Does anyone here pay for news on the internet? Yes, I'm paying. Oh boy, <laughs> this is pretty dark. <laughs> okay, but you have newspapers subscribe, I suppose. Now what newspapers are doing is they're saying, you know what, we're not really selling the news. In the past, we've sold the paper. The paper had the ads that paid for the reporters. And what people were buying was not the news, right? it was the packaging of the news, the print. And that's why we were able to sell the advertising. So my friend Ross Dawson, who's a futurist from Australia, came up with this beautiful chart that basically says there's 150 reasons what people would pay for. They would pay for the interface, the relevance, the timeliness, the design, the curation, the reputation. Right? 
Now, you're in a very similar position, even if you're not in the newspaper business, this is your future. Because guess what? People are not paying for your software, they're not paying for your banking services, they're not even buying your car. They're paying for everything around it, right? the value around the core. People stick with ban banks because of trust. People buy from telecom providers not because they're sent cheaper for the SIM card. Right? Well, that's sometimes one of the reasons, of course. Right? But because of added values. So one of the key questions, I think, for smarter business in the future is to figure out, let's not go too heavy on the pitch of saying that people should be paying for X, Y, Z, like uh, newspapers are doing with paywalls, so-called paywalls. Right? You may be familiar with the New York Times, which is the world's most uh, reputable, supposedly, newspaper, and I'm a great fan of the New York Times and many of their writers. So. When you go to NewYorkTimes.com and you're reading the newspaper, after 10 times, it will find out by putting a cookie, a software cookie, right, that you've been there 10 times and will put up a gate and say, well, you like us so much, you want to come back and read, but now, hold on, it's $300. $300. And if I'm lucky, it will give me a grace period to say, you can have six weeks for $50, or whatever the trick would be. And they call this the paywall, forcing people to pay. Now the New York Times, who is the oldest, the most reputable, the largest organization in the world for news, really, for newspapers, 320 million people in the US, guess how many people love the New York Times so much that they're doing this? 950,000. And the New York Times says this is a huge success. And of course the advertising is dropping like a rock because the traffic is decreasing because people can't get in. So the logic of forcing people to pay on the internet is totally flawed. The logic of making people do something that they're not ready to do will just won't work. We've seen that in the music business, we've seen it in the airline business, we've seen it all over the place. And so basically our strategy has to be this, and this goes for every brand, to build value around the core. If you're a bank, you offer services about financial discussion. You offer content, you offer things that people can tap into. I'll give you some examples. You know, you create a market. Facebook. Again, I hope you didn't buy Facebook stock. You know, I, I advise people to wait, <laughs> so it was a good idea, I suppose. But I have high hopes for their stock for the future, so maybe it's a good time now. I don't want to predict anything, though. Uh, so Facebook just came up with this three days ago. You know what it is? Facebook gift. Now imagine this, if you have 1,000 friends on Facebook, and they really are friends, not just fake friends. Imagine that Facebook tells you it's XYZ birthday, you know, that you know really well next week. And from their profile, which is very deep on Facebook, Facebook knows this guy likes mountain bikes. Okay. So I can get a bunch of my friends together and buy a mountain bike through Facebook. The person gets a digital gift on Facebook, a digital wrapped gift with music and everything. Right? And they can type in when, when and where they want it delivered to be ready for their birthday. Using all of the cool data that Facebook has about our friends, and this could be for flowers, it could be for jets, I don't know, you know. That business didn't even exist. But Facebook just crossed, last week, one billion users. Facebook is the biggest country in the world apart from China, maybe India. And yesterday there were 27 billion minutes spent on Facebook, every fourth minute on the internet. So if you're still thinking this is an aberration, you know, I can't help you. <laughs> Because, you know, clearly this is a highway, right? This is a highway for commerce. I mean, think about that. Don't you want to be, if you're selling stuff, right? Don't you want to be part of this gifting thing on Facebook? This would be a no-brainer, right? As a retailer in Poland, you would want people to buy gifts through Facebook from you. Right? And that, all of that stuff is being set up. So Facebook created a market with this, and Pesa created a market for mobile money, and LinkedIn. Let me see. Uh, let me see your hands. Who was on LinkedIn? I think everyone is on LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn, for some reason, has been becoming more professional, or has been viewed as more professional. I was number seven thousand on LinkedIn when I signed up. 
And that was like 50 years ago, whatever. And when I did this, I invite people to join me on LinkedIn. I think this was 2003 or something like that, when Ray Hoffman started it. Um, when I signed up, I invited about 100 people. You know what they said to me? They said, what in the world are you doing giving these people my email address? I don't want to connect with strangers. If I want to do business with you, I already know you, or somebody is going to introduce me to you in real life. I don't need this stuff. Today, I'm getting over 400 invitations a day on LinkedIn. Because people have realized that having, being networked, even if you're the CEO of a company, right? being networked is what it's all about. So today, when you go to a meeting, I mean, all of us do this, right? Before you come to this conference, you went to my LinkedIn profile. Right? It's okay to admit. Right? To see what the hell is this guy. Right? You're going to have a meeting with Play or with any other mobile operator, you check out the VP of whatever on LinkedIn to see what he's like. Right? It takes you about 40 seconds, you can do it in a taxi, and you can say, oh, you went to Harvard, I went to Harvard too, or I tried. Right? So this is what's happening, and LinkedIn has built on this network business idea They've built this business absolutely mind-boggling, right? No wonder their IPO went so well. And look what has taken the biggest leap there is hiring solutions. That didn't even exist when LinkedIn started. I mean, look at the pillow over there, right? I mean, in the very beginning, LinkedIn didn't even know what a hiring solution would be. They set out to connect people like Facebook, but business. So the lesson here is sometimes you have to create a market that doesn't really exist yet. And you'll find out as you're creating it what the opportunities are of what you have created. And this can be very risky. I mean, clearly LinkedIn has found a winning formula with marketing solutions, but you know, many HR departments today, we don't need them. We have LinkedIn. I mean, if you're in the HR business, you know people are looking at each other for hiring all the time on LinkedIn. That has become the prime resource. How much more time do I have? Five, five hours? It's 1.15, right? Well, okay. Huh? Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, and I have to hurry up then. OK. All right, so um, this is actually a very fitting picture for the hurry up here. OK, so we're living in this tunnel, right? We are now in this tunnel. This tunnel is completely multi-leveled, multi-reality. And in a way, it's, it's a parallel challenge of what we have today, what we had yesterday, and what we're going to have next week, and what we're going to have in three years. These are all happening in parallel ways. So I think what needs to happen is that the old order of how stuff used to work continues because it still makes money. Right? And we can't just drop dead with it. Can't stop printing, can't stop with real money, can't stop with credit cards, can't stop with cars. Right? But let me ask you a question. Who in this room believes that 10 years from now, most of us will be driving around in gasoline-fueled cars. It's very unlikely. Very, very unlikely, and this is something that we have to face. So there's a new order coming up, right? And that new order is tomorrow. So what we have to do is we have to parallelize the two. Right? We have to work on the new order to take over the old order while we're doing the old order. Right? And this is not easy to be done. I think it's basically a dualistic approach. Many of my clients are using this for innovation. And some of my clients are saying, we can't do this in-house because it will kill us. Right? We'll fund an entity that will try to, to take us over from the outside, but we own it. So that's one approach of a dualistic approach to the future. Um, I talked about this already last year, but clearly data is becoming the key source of e-commerce. Right? Knowing what people are, who they are, what they want to do, what intentions they have, where they come from. Right? Companies that deal with data, like Twitter, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Skype, eBay, and so on, right, are the ones who are prospering the most. I mean, look at the amount of data that's being collected right, on a daily basis. Many people have said this before, and I think it was originally from the American Marketing Association, a guy named Clive Humby, who said, 2006, that data is the new oil. All of you are generating data in your business. You need to harvest it, process it, right? as, as we heard earlier from IBM, find ways to make sense of it, 
identify it. I mean, look at this slide. It's a little bit hard to see. You can see it better on the PDF later, right? But 52% of CEOs are saying they have to make decisions without having good data available. I mean, clearly, in what we have today, if you just go to search.twitter.com and you put in the name of your company, you know, if it's not really small bakery here in Warsaw, you know, then you can find people talking about your company in real time. I mean, monitoring people's conversations, looking at how we are already paying with data. I mean, clearly, this is a future, uh, and many business models are based on this. You know, it's, uh, as the cartoon says, it's free, but they sell your information. Very powerful model. This is the Facebook model, of course, right? selling information. So if you're, in, if you're in business collecting data from your customers, this is very, very important, is to get the data, to be able to use it, to get permission, to monitor it, to move forward based on things from this data. I don't have time to get into all the details here, but uh, you're welcome to download the PDF later. Um, maybe we can formulate some questions while I'm here fishing for my finishing slides here. Okay, this is how we used to do business, right? lots of phone calls, connecting with people, but the future of what we're doing you know, in, in smart commerce is basically this, right? is the cloud, which is content, is our business, is data, connecting with devices and with the, the people behind it, of course, connecting the cloud and the crowd. Content marketing, earned media, and what I, what I call return on involvement. So, Basically, the ROI calculation, the return on investment, gets turned around to say, how involved are we with our customers? And what can we get back from this? And that's how it turns into money, connecting the crowd and the cloud. I think this is a crucial thing that we're seeing in the future. And one of the challenges is this, you know, we're all sort of little plastic men, but we're not the same. Uh, fragmentation is going to absolutely explode. Every customer wants something different. Um, this goes for all kinds of industries. For example, in the travel industry where I do a lot of work, the number of people who go to unknown locations, not Las Vegas, not Sao Paulo, not Rio de Janeiro, wherever, right, to places that haven't been gone to before very much, right, has increased from like 4% to over 30%. People are going like this. Right? Fragmentation of habits, of choices, this is clearly going to be a challenge. Um, it's really only five minutes, right? Really? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, hopefully you get to see the slideshow later so that we can come back to this. Okay. Um, as you can see, I had lots of choices. You know, I didn't want to deprive you of this. Um, so, the future of brands, I think this is a very important part of the conversation today. There's a great book that just came out by Robert Bagua called Lyconomics. And this may strike you as a very American view of the world. Maybe it is. But the idea of your users and your customers, especially B2B, right? Especially B2B, liking you as a company, liking your offering and expressing that, for example, not through Facebook, but through many other means, right? And uh, Kraft Foods has a great commercial that they put up where people that like Kraft were asked to join a band. Watch this clip here. So this is an interesting phenomenon, right? Brands want to be liked, and so Kraft Foods, which make really boring stuff, macaroni and ketchup and stuff like that, right? They, they made a movie out of being liked, I think, two million times on Facebook. And they used people from the movie to actually, from the, from the liking crowd to actually do this. So Lyconomics is now very real, and I think this is something that you should keep in mind. Um, as a sort of a wrapper of this topic is that really it's all about trust when you're talking about social, local, mobile. Now, I'll skip ahead one more time, and then we will indeed move towards lunch. I don't want to keep you from eating. That would be terrible. 
How many people are using Dropbox here? Anybody Dropbox? Okay. Dropbox, just as a final example, is really good at this, and this is the Amazon motto, right? Delighting your customers. This is an email I got from Dropbox right, about six weeks ago. Usually when you get emails from companies, it says, you know, we're very sorry to tell you that as of now you have to pay twice as much as before. Right? But Dropbox sent me an email that said, congratulations, we've doubled your space on Dropbox. Right? I don't know why, but it was a, a present. Right? Just a present. Amazon sent me an email nine months ago saying, if you live in the US, as of now you have 5,000 free movies you can watch on the Amazon movie service just because you're a premium customer. It's a present. That's a really, really key point for the future is to think about you know, how do we connect with people by delighting them. So a quick summary and then uh, some questions if we have time. Hey. Four sites, okay? Uh, clearly going beyond the obvious. We touched on that in the beginning. If you have nobody in your company looking beyond the obvious, the obvious will catch up with you before you're ready for it. So that is, I think, is a job really for everyone. Shaping the future rather than waiting for the future, as the Tesco chief tells us. Dive into big data. What can you do with the data that you're collecting? Who is allowed to use it? Can you create APIs, application platform interfaces, to swap data with other people and generate value from it? I mean, clearly that's a trend that we're seeing on the web everywhere. Integrate social, local, mobile today. And if you don't live in this world, you have to. I mean, this is clearly the world that we're going to see. People with tablets doing these things, and they're going to be anywhere from 15 to 75 years old. So integrating social, local, mobile, connecting the crowd and the cloud, crowdsourcing we didn't have time to talk about. Rebuild your company to be truly networked and interconnected. I mean, this is a very large mission, of course. Companies are not connected, with very few exceptions, like Apple. Apple is sort of the asocial company, you could say, even though they have a large developer group. Right? They will be there for a while, but by and large, a disconnected company will be disconnected and with uh, probably fatal results. Focus on human-centric technologies. Right? This is not about tech, this is not about geeks, this is not about cool software, it's about what it does for people. It's not about all the other stuff that it could be doing, right? but about the stuff that it actually does for people. And do you have a product that can make you the market maker? My theory is that most companies, like car companies, uh, transportation companies, airlines, and so, they're all now in the process of making a new market. And not just getting a new plane, right, but actually making a new product. Adopting open strategies, we didn't really get into this. But if you want to be trusted, you have to be open. Right, clearly, nobody's going to trust you if you keep secrets of everything that you do and what you're thinking. The last is the most important. Imagine some company would do what you do for one-tenth of the money and would do it instantly. That is the future. That is going to happen to almost all of us. So our choice at this point is to take what people are going to use to disrupt us and make it ours. I mean, again, I think there we're going into a direction where it's all about having foresight and getting that quicker. And I think uh, the, the idea of doing smarter commerce is exactly that, because in the future there won't be anything except for smart commerce. There won't be any dumb commerce, in parentheses, if, if that even exists today. Right? There won't be any commerce left that's not smart. So I think that's the direction that we're going. To finish this off with a quote from the Tesco CEO, lead the revolution or be a victim of the evolution. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much for this insightful presentation. Ah, I think one we question. have, that. yeah, we are very punctual. Uh, uh, but we will find we some time question? for questions. Państwo, czy są jakieś pytania, komentarze, to Gerda? I have a Twitter question. We'll take this one first. Okay. So somebody here is actually twittering. Wow. Petrazi, get off the No, no. How do you see the future for Apple? <laughs> Let me take a look. <laughs> Will, will closed environments survive? Well, 
obviously I'm an Apple fan and I use all the Apple stuff. But I think the likelihood that you can survive with a closed controlled strategy that's based on genius is very little. I think Apple will survive because it did that well, or at least for the next three to five years, because it has done that well. But I think this is like buying a lottery ticket. Uh, I think basically what we're seeing here is that most companies are going the opposite. They're trying to connect with others to build a system that sustains, which by definition is open. Like in software, clearly, if your software doesn't talk to other softwares, if you don't have a APIs, if you don't feed from the information river, then you disconnected, you're dead. So you look at what's happening with Amazon or with Cisco, or Intel, or IBM, or many others, right? It's all about connecting with others, not actually owning all of the pieces of the connection. And I think it's basically a whole evolution of business that we're seeing that is moving to a situation to where it's about building a common product, for example, or something that's dependent on others. There's a great movie you should watch. It's called Connected, the movie, by T Tiffany Schlain. I think you can get it on iTunes or so. It's talking about how we're becoming more interdependent. And we're actually becoming dependent on others to create new business models. That, that's nowhere more obvious than in banking, financial services, right? the complete, I mean, the information that, that people have available now. You can go to American Express Open Forum, you can find out all there is about money and, and buying stocks and all that stuff. You don't need your bank. It's like a record label. So what is the bank then going to do to take a new space in that food chain to add more value? I have to connect with others. And there is a role, of course, for that in the future. I'm not saying there's no role for banks. There is, clearly. In many ways, uh, if you see, for example, what happens in newspapers, Ten years ago, the ARPU, the average revenue per user for newspaper in America was, was $300 a year for each reader. The ARPU of Google per user was $5. The music industry made billions of dollars, about $40 billion a year, from selling CDs from records that they had purchased the rights for 30 years ago. So we have this expectation of huge business for very little effort. Right? And then the web comes along and it says, now you have to reinvent a lot and get very little back in the beginning. Right? It's like a total flip. So therefore, if we take from what we did yesterday and we superimpose into the future, we tend to want to say it has to be as good, as least as good as it was until now. Well, that is a fatal flaw, right? Because there's no such thing. There's no thing that keeps us in the same business without inventing a new one. So the question, I think, is very good because basically it shows the way forward, in my view, is the co-creation of interesting new business models. And as I was saying earlier, the hyper-competition. Think of your fiercest competitor. Is there something you can do together to actually create a new product that will benefit everyone in that chain? Any other questions? Keep tweeting. Is there anything else we can slow down this, uh, this digital trends? I've heard there are some uh, new consumer trends that the people got tired and want to be locked out. There are even some travel agencies when you can book the uh, trip, uh, they pick you up all your mobile devices for one or, or two weeks and you are totally disconnected. <laughs> you forget about the social media and all the things. And, uh, uh, from the other side, I work for insurance uh, insurance sector, where there is uh, a lot of about privacy, and well, uh, many digital projects failed because of the privacy and the let's say need from the customers to to be connected to the human being and not to the device. Let's say. Yeah. Well, of course, that's that's a huge societal change that we're willing to accept uh, more a little bit less privacy for more services. Right? For example, when Google launched Gmail, you know, all of you, I'm sure, one or the other using Gmail, right? when Gmail came along, everybody said, this is terrible because Google is reading my email. Right? I mean, and they had people reading it to learn, right? not, not just machines. Right? Because Google is putting ads. I mean, I have about 350,000 emails on Gmail. Right? So Google is putting the ads that they've learned from 350,000 mails and conversations 
into the sidebar of my Google, and it's so close to what I am, it's scary. Right? So people said, this is bad because Google reads my email, and it looks like they actually looked at it. It's very scary. And nobody wanted to use it. Turns out Gmail was the best thing ever that happened to email for a lot of people. Right? Today you have 220 million users, and people are saying, well, so what? They read my email. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised that they know me for my email, right? but I've kind of gotten used to it. But there is a limit to that. I think people will get used to some of these things. That depends very much on cultural things, you know, where we are. We're not the same as people in Korea or even in America. Right? So clearly it's a cultural question. I think the other thing is that clearly also offline is becoming the new luxury. And this is actually quite good. I mean, in many ways now, being offline or not being connected is important right? and is becoming sort of the detox. Uh, <laughs> in many ways, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, when you're on really powerful devices, it's a little bit like a drug. And, and in fact, there's about 46 clinics in Korea for internet addiction. Right? And this is, uh, this is happening on a global level. Right? That, will, uh, that will normalize. I mean, remember, for example, when the telephone came along, People were afraid that people were not going to visit each other anymore because they can make a phone call. Not true. When the uh, video recorder came along, people said people won't go to the theater to watch a show. Not true. So I'm not that worried about it. I think that privacy is the number one issue, clearly. And uh, I think in the future we'll be paying for privacy. We'll, be, we'll find a mechanism, for example, Google will have offers that we can buy our privacy back from Google. Uh, that will be quite an interesting business. But clearly the uh, number one threat to a lot of these things, social, local, mobile, is the concern about privacy. So that, that has to be solved and people are working on that. Um, as I was saying in my last slide, most important about technology not, is not what the machine likes or what the database likes. Right? It's about what people like. So if you're using technology, it always has to have a human purpose. Bringing the, human, uh, the customer closer to you, creating a bond, creating value, right? that is the, really the value of technology. And sometimes it, that actually means using less technology. So I'm, I'm not entirely 100% uh, you know, on everything is good that we have here. But having said that, I think the connectivity that will become a network is absolutely inevitable. I mean, that. It's a little bit like, you know, you've seen the Matrix or Minority Report. I think it's Matrix, where you can be on the grid or you can be off the grid. I think very few of us will be off that grid of connectivity if we are in business. You know, this is going to be also quite a challenge because sometimes we'll become a little bit naked, so to speak. But I think uh, there's no need for regulation on this. I think that basically this is a question of our own responsibility. For example, on my Facebook or LinkedIn pages or so, you will not see my wife or my kids. You, know, you, you can find out about me pretty well on the internet, but you can't find out you know, what my kids have been doing or what my birthday party looked like or whatever. Right? That's where I draw the line. So I think all of us have to draw that line. And this can, can be quite difficult. Right? I mean, we have, in this country and in Europe in general, we have more concerns about showing ourselves. You know? and in Switzerland, for example, it's completely not you know, being exhibitionist about who you are. That's a cultural question I think that needs to be maintained also. But the long-winded answer is, you know, if you want to look for a future business, keeping privacy and safeguarding it while you can still use the data, that's a huge business. And that's definitely going to be a, a challenge for a lot of business models. But as I said in the beginning with the, with the Gmail example, people get used to different services at different times and it becomes part of normal in parentheses. I'm not sure that's good or bad, but that is also a trend. Thanks for the question. Kolejne pytania. Any other on Twitter? Oh yes, we have, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. That's actually working, thanks, Tato. Okay, I have to read this before I read it to you. That is a bit of a filter. What would be the advised way to develop for the music industry, in your opinion? Well, that's a short answer. Go away. <laughs> no, just kidding. 
Um, I worked in the music business for a long time. And the way to develop for those the legacy uh, industries that made lots of money doing very little uh, is to essentially have a reboot. I mean, it's quite clear that pe people love music. There's great artists. People are willing to pay. Huh? People are willing to pay for content. They pay for Netflix. They pay for Spotify. They pay for Farmville. They pay for LinkedIn. Right? So who here pays for LinkedIn? Let me see. People pay for premium LinkedIn? No, I, you're too ashamed to admit it. I pay for LinkedIn. But anyway, there's no such problem that people don't want to pay, that they hate music. All not true. Right? So all the arguments are barking up the wrong tree. So the recreation of that, for example, in music would be clearly to adopt a fully digital model that's based on access, not on ownership. Granted this, of course, the music industry is the worst case because there are only four companies in the world, really, that ran the music business. That, that means four guys, right? literally guys, too. Right? BMG, Warner, Sony, well, four guys running the whole thing. So if you're in that kind of industry, it's extremely hard because they all agree that they shouldn't be doing it and then the world changes, right? But it didn't. So that's kind of hard. I think the more open an industry is, publishing maybe, television, the more open you are, the more quicker you are to move with where things are going. So music industry is kind of a tough case, but anyway, uh, don't have a standard solution. Final question, do you agree that when you don't pay for service, you're not a customer, only a product being sold? Lawrence Koster. That's interesting. I think what's happening is that in this service, we are the content, right? We are the show of Facebook. In fact, many people say that Facebook is a perpetual virtual TV show, and we are the actors. I mean, we are the content of Facebook. What are we getting, and what is Facebook getting? Right now, it's a deal. Right? I say to Facebook, you give me this way of talking to people, and communicating, and doing stuff, and promoting myself also. Right? And I give you my data, so you can sell advertising. Is that a bad deal? I, I think it could be. But if it's carefully handled, not really. I mean, that's kind of an OK deal, I think if we watch it on both sides. And you know, we are the currency of this, of this network. So in many ways, a, cu a customer that's p what I call this paying with attention, when you pay with attention, that's worth real money. I mean, we're paying with attention in many different ways. Right? You know, everything that we do on Google is paying. We're paying with attention and with data. I'm not sure that's a bad model. I think that's also pretty much an inevitable model as long as we can make sure that we are in control of what we're giving and when, which seems to be the major problem behind Facebook. Right? But anyway, I think the future for that is uh, quite bright here, because these business models are being generated right now. Before Facebook, nobody had to invent anything like this. And it's, this is a tough job for Zuckerberg and his people. They have to invent all of this. Right? Advertising on Facebook that we used to have on the internet won't work you're going to see the complete reinvention of advertising as part of this model. Anyway, thanks very much. Uh, and you can download my slideshow in about two hours from Twitter, G. Leonhardt, and of course from the website. Thanks very much for having me again.